On today's episode, we are out here in the forest taking a look at the 2017 Subaru Outback, as I've been promising for some time. The Outback is something of an enigma because this really is one of a kind. At its heart, the Outback is a Subaru Legacy station wagon that's had its ride height increased to a very SUV-like 8.7 inches. That's just about the same ride height that you find in a Jeep Grand Cherokee. The all-wheel drive system and the increased ride height are not really what make the Outback unique in America, however. What's really unique about this is the fact that it is still a station wagon, and it's the only mid-sized mainstream station wagon in the United States. We do, of course, find a variety of European luxury station wagons in the United States, but they're all going to be significantly more expensive than the Subaru. Logically, the Outback's overall design is very similar to the Subaru Legacy. We have a very similar grille right here with the Subaru logo in the middle. We have this sort of metallic painted plastic section lower on the bumper and more rugged body cladding all the way around. Large fog lamps down here. We have an LED strip inside the headlamp module, and our model does have xenon headlamps. The Subaru Legacy is a mid-sized sedan, therefore the Subaru Outback is a mid-sized station wagon. At 189.6 inches long, this is almost exactly the same size as a Jeep Grand Cherokee, interestingly enough. But of course, the Subaru Legacy is a station wagon, not your more traditional boxy crossover. That's where Subaru's Forester steps in. So we have a window line and an overall roof line that is definitely very classic station wagon. They've tried to give the rear end a slightly rounder look, a slightly more raked profile right there overall to make it a little bit sportier looking than the classic American station wagon. But if you're after a classic American station wagon, this is your only option in this segment. We don't find a Ford Fusion wagon, a Chrysler 200 wagon, a Camry wagon, or an Accord wagon. The biggest difference between something like the Outback and a more traditional crossover is really going to be the seating position, both for the front and the rear passengers. This is going to be very car-like as far as the more relaxed seating position rather than the upright seating position that you find in a RAV4 or a CRV. Just as you'd expect from a traditional station wagon, we have a longer hood than you find in most compact crossovers. But what makes the comparisons a little bit trickier still with the Outback is that this is priced like your average compact crossover, not necessarily like your average mid-sized crossover, even though again, this is just about the same size overall as a Ford Edge or a Jeep Grand Cherokee. The increased ride height that we find in the Outback is definitely noticeable from the rear view, where you can actually see some of the suspension components from this camera angle. Like the front, we have some more rugged body cladding lower on the bumper, fairly well integrated parking sensors right here, and we have these tail lamp modules that wrap from the body onto the hatch lid. Turn signals on on that side so you can see what that looks like. When it comes to engines, Subaru has always marched to a slightly different drummer. You don't find inline or V engines under this hood. Things start out with a 2.5 liter boxer style engine. That's what we have in this particular model. It produces 175 horsepower and 174 pound feet of torque. There's also a 3.6 liter six cylinder boxer engine available and that produces 256 horsepower. Both engines are mated to a continuously variable transmission and standard all wheel drive. This all wheel drive system now sends 60% of the power to the front axle, 40% of the power to the rear axle under most conditions for both engine designs. There was a time where the Outback and the Legacy with the six cylinder engine actually had a rear power bias, but that's a little bit different with this new CVT. Fuel economy is the big reason that the majority of the power is sent to the front axle now, because this four cylinder engine will average 28 miles per gallon with the standard all wheel drive system. Although if you get the 3.6 liter V6, that does drop quite a ways down to 22. It's obvious when you take a look under the hood that Subaru did have mild off-roading in mind because they've positioned the alternator nice and high on the engine to help keep it out of the way of mud and water. Front seat comfort is very good in the Outback. We have a tilt telescopic steering column with a wide range of motion. Our model also has two-way adjustable lumbar support. The power seat in our model offers more adjustability than some of the entries in the mainstream midsize sedan or mainstream compact crossover category, but this seat is definitely more comfortable than your average compact crossover. Of course, as I said earlier, the key thing to know about the Outback is you'll notice that my driving position is very car-like. My legs are definitely stretched out further in front of me. I'm not sitting quite as upright as I would in the average crossover. Hopping into the rear seats, you will definitely find more legroom and more importantly, more width than your average compact crossover. That's because again, this is based on a mid-size sedan. Now, even though the seating position is not quite as upright and the roof line is not quite as high as your average crossover, I still have about an inch of headroom left sitting in the middle. Our model does have the optional sunroof. Moving all the way over to the right side of the car, this front seat is all the way back in its tracks and I still have about five inches of legroom left. 
A nice touch with the Outback's rear seats is that it offers some recline ability. We have about three inches of overall motion in the seat back. These seats recline from either the cargo area or from the seating area right here. And we have a middle seat with a fold down center armrest, padded area, but no storage cubby and two cup holders. Although the Outback is about the same size as a Grand Cherokee, you might be tempted to think that you'd find more cargo storage space in the Jeep than in the Subaru, but you'd actually be wrong. Even though the box on top of the wheels in the Jeep is taller and squarer than we find in the Outback, we have about the same kind of storage space right behind the cargo hatch. This holds about 35 and a half cubic feet of things, which is only a sliver behind the Grand Cherokee and doesn't really make any appreciable difference when it comes to our bag test score. And then if we lift the cargo area load floor, we find a little bit more space under there as well. Of course, the reason that the Grand Cherokee has a taller box riding on top of its wheels and about the same kind of storage space inside is because the two vehicles have very different missions. The Grand Cherokee is a more rugged off-road intended vehicle, even though most people won't take it off-road. And as a result, it has a full-size spare tire. It has more structure going on under the vehicle. And that's really the difference between it and the Outback. So this is just slightly more efficient for the average use. When it comes to our exclusive trunk comfort index, I'm gonna give this nine out of 10 points. This is a hair smaller and a hair less practical than some of those mid-sized two row crossovers out there, but this is significantly larger, significantly wider and more practical than the average two row compact crossover. And again, about the same size as the Grand Cherokee. We also have an available power hatch. As you'd expect, the interior is very similar to the Subaru Legacy, although there are a few touches that are unique to the Outback. We have height adjustable seat belts for both the driver and the front passenger, and we have four-way adjustable headrests. These ratchet forward in that manner. Our particular model has these very attractive brown leather seats with slightly more rugged stitching than we find in the Legacy. These seats are perforated, but they're not ventilated. They're just heated. Although we do find hard plastics on the lower side of the door panel, the majority of the door panel is full of soft touch plastic. So we find a soft touch upper section here, leather insert right here, and a soft touch armrest. This is definitely more soft plastic than you find in your average compact crossover. The doors in our model are trimmed with this imitation wood trim and an attractive metallic painted strip below that. That trim continues on over to the dashboard. We do find a soft touch injection molded upper section and hard plastics below that wood trim. The glove box is a moderately sized bin glove box. I was not able to fit a large tablet computer in there, but I was able to fit something a little bit smaller, more like an iPad mini. Moving over to the center of the dashboard, we have two large air vents and a hazard light button. And then our model has the optional infotainment and navigation system. This offers Sirius XM and HD radio, an iPod interface, but most importantly, no Apple CarPlay or Android Auto integration. We do have Subaru Starlink and Mirror Link, which is sort of a precursor to Android Auto if your devices support those. You'll find a single slot optical disc player right up here and the SD card for the mapping database over there on the right. Below that, we have a dual zone climate control system in our model and we have heated seats on either side of that. Below that, we have a small storage cubby that is not able to fit an iPhone 7 Plus right in there, although if you did have a smaller smartphone, it would fit inside. This cubby is where you will find the USB port that integrates with the system, the auxiliary input, and a 12 volt power outlet. Behind that, we have a fairly traditional console shifter. Drive is all the way back. Manual mode is over to the left. Subaru does not give you an option to use this shifter to shift gears in the manual mode. You do have to use the paddles on the back of the steering wheel. Working our way back from that, we have an electric parking brake, our X mode button, which affects the way the all wheel drive system, stability and traction control system behave. It also gives you hill descent control. To the right of that, we have two large fixed cup holders. And then between the front seats, we have a softly padded center armrest. It opens to reveal a large storage cubby with a removable divider where you can put things like wallets, keys, and we have a 12 volt power outlet right up front. The instrument cluster is based around a color multifunction display in the center, and then large rings on either side that contain the tachometer and the temperature gauge over here on the left, the speedometer and the fuel gauge on the right. In the multifunction display, we find things like our trip computer, navigation instructions, a digital speedometer, that sort of thing. We also have a fixed mile per gallon gauge that goes on either side of the center to tell you whether you're increasing or decreasing your average fuel economy. Since we're parked and running the engine, obviously we're decreasing it, so it's all the way over here to the left. In the center, we find the readouts for the safety systems in the vehicle, like the lane keeping assistance and lane departure warning system and the adaptive cruise control. This is not radar adaptive cruise control. It actually is a binocular camera system. Those cameras are mounted right around the rear view mirror. The steering wheel is an attractive three spoke design with small sport grips right up top and those paddle shifters on each side, down on the left and up over here on the right side. 
Our model has the heated steering wheel, so you'll find that paddle over here on the right side. On the left side, we have the buttons that control that multifunction display right there between the speedometer and the tachometer. We have up, down, and an I slash set button. Above that, we have volume up, down, track forward, backward, a mute button, and then these buttons also work with the infotainment and navigation system. It allows you to select various options without having to reach over to that infotainment screen in the center of the dash. On the right side, we have the controls for the adaptive cruise control system, distance increase, decrease, speed set, up and down, enable, disable, and then the lane keeping assistance button. The adaptive cruise control system uses this twin camera setup right here above the rear view mirror. The operation of this system is a little bit different than radar adaptive cruise control systems. Obviously, these are looking through the windscreen just like I am. So we have windshield wipers that these have to interact with, etc. If the windscreen is foggy, it won't be able to see the car. The system will tell you if it thinks that its vision is blocked. Depending on the weather conditions, this system may be a little bit less capable than your average radar system. However, on the flip side, if you're involved in a minor fender bender, this system is not going to get damaged and therefore it's going to be cheaper to repair. The Subaru Outback is exactly the kind of car that was created for my demographic. I live in rural Santa Cruz County out here in the Redwood Forest. I drive a mile down a gravel road like we're on right here, and occasionally there are large sticks down in the road. When it rains, big ruts can form in the road. But this is a private road, so you can drive at sort of a moderate clip. And the Outback's all-wheel drive system and suspension were designed exactly with this kind of road surface in mind but we don't have locking differentials, either in the center or in the front or in the rear. That means that the all-wheel drive system is very capable, but it's not quite as capable as that next step up in the off-road vehicle category. It does, however, quite simply mean that you can take the Outback places you could not take a RAV4 or a CRV or a Nissan Rogue or most of the other compact crossovers because the Outback has a greater ability to clear obstacles on the road than many of those compact crossovers. In addition, we have an always on all wheel drive system. So if I were to slow down, move over to the middle and side of the road where it's more gravelly on the slope right here and then floor the vehicle, we get instant traction because this all wheel drive system doesn't require any wheel slip to send at least 40% of the power to the rear axle. Now, unlike previous Subaru systems, this system is going to try and keep the majority of the power up front to improve fuel economy, but the system is just as willing as previous systems to send power to the rear axle. That means that this is going to feel much more sure-footed on a wide variety of surfaces, gravel, snow, sleet, ice, etc. Back out on the road, we ran from zero to 60 in 9.6 seconds. That is a little bit slow for the mid-sized sedan category, but remember that the Outback has standard all-wheel drive, and that does increase the loss in the drivetrain. The six-cylinder Outback is going to be notably faster than this four-cylinder model. It's going to be less efficient, and it's going to be a little bit louder under the hood. It also has a continuously variable transmission, just like this four-cylinder engine does as well. Although CVTs generally help improve zero to 60 performance, the six-cylinder Outback still lags behind the high horsepower options that we find in the competition. In our on-road braking test, we stopped from 60 miles an hour back to zero in 124 feet. That's fairly similar to the average four-cylinder Honda Accord or Toyota Camry. Comparisons are a little bit tricky, of course, with the Outback, because you could compare this with the four-cylinder Accord and the four-cylinder Camry, or you could compare this with the four-cylinder CRV or RAV4, because this sits somewhere in between those two vehicles. For the rest of our comparisons, however, we'll be comparing this to the average mid-size sedan, because it makes a little bit more sense, because the overall structure of the vehicle is a mid-size station wagon. When it comes to handling, I'm going to give the Outback a B-. This has a fairly soft suspension for this category, although actual road grip is fairly comparable to four-cylinder Accord and four-cylinder Camry models. Because of the off-road or soft-road mission of the Outback, the suspension is higher off the ground, it's also softer than your average mid-size sedan, and that means we get a decent amount more body roll when we start entering these corners, and overall the chassis feels just a little bit less composed. However, this still feels more put together than your average crossover when taking this vehicle at the same speeds around corners. What that really means for the average driver is that once you get used to the way this suspension feels, you'll be able to carve the corners just about as fast as that Accord in front of you. Of course, when the road surface starts to break down a bit, you'll actually make faster progress in the Outback than your average mid-size sedan or compact crossover. And the suspension is the key to this again, because the Outback suspension with all this suspension travel and that high ground clearance really make easy work of these big bumps in the road. There's a reason they always seem to use Subaru models when shooting a film in Australia and they're just flying down those dirt roads in the Outback, because this is exactly the kind of suspension you need to soak up that kind of bump. Subaru has long been criticized for making vehicles that were just a little bit louder than the competition out on the road, and that is true for the Outback. We scored 75.5 decibels 
in our cabin noise test, and that is pretty high for the midsize sedan category or your average crossover. There are two likely reasons for the increased cabin noise. The four-cylinder boxer engine appears to be a little bit louder than the average entry's four-cylinder inline engine, and we just don't find quite as much sound deadening in this cabin. Now that said, wind noise has improved over previous generations of the Outback because the doors now have sills on them. When you open the door and there's just a piece of glass, there's no metal part on the top of the door, that's a sillless door, and those are generally a little bit louder than we find in silled doors like we now have in the Outback. You might be wondering why Subaru has not spent more time sound deadening this cabin, and I propose that one of the reasons for that is the low price in the Subaru Outback that we'll be talking about very soon. Keep in mind again that the Subaru Outback, like most Subarus sold in America, comes standard with all-wheel drive. And because the Subaru Outback and other Subarus tend to be very comparably priced with other manufacturers' base models, the money for that all-wheel drive system has to come from somewhere, so they do have to cut a few corners here and there in order to give you that all-wheel drive system. That's not unique to Subaru. Every manufacturer tends to cut corners here or there based on their priorities and their marketing angle. For Subaru, that's all-wheel drive. For Toyota, the pursuit is reliability, and they're willing to give up the latest gadgets and the latest gizmos in order to try and make the vehicle as reliable as possible. And on the other end of the scale, we have something like the Mazda 6, which is known for its handling ability and its handling feel, but there are a few other corners cut in the vehicle in order to spend the money on that side of development. Because most Subaru models come standard with all-wheel drive, but they have to compete in terms of fuel economy with the competition's front-wheel drive models, Subaru has taken very impressive steps to improve fuel economy across the board. We've been averaging 29 miles per gallon over a week of very mixed driving out here in the forest with this Outback, and that is absolutely excellent for a vehicle this size with all-wheel drive standard. In fact, 29 miles per gallon is better than some vehicles in the mid-size sedan segment or even the compact crossover segment will get in two-wheel drive form. Thanks to the efficient engine design and the CVT, this easily gets an a when it comes to fuel economy. Now you should know if you get the six-cylinder Outback, then fuel economy drops quite a bit down to about 20 to 21 miles per gallon average, and that's actually lower than many of the four-cylinder turbos we see from the competition. I have to say that I'm a little bit disappointed that Subaru doesn't use their excellent four-cylinder turbocharged engine that we see in the Forester XT in the Subaru Outback. I think that would be a great engine for this vehicle. Subaru's Legacy is one of the least expensive mid-size sedans in the mainstream category, and that does translate directly to the Outback. The Outback starts at $25,645 for the 2017 model year. That's $3,650 higher than the Legacy sedan on which it's based. Because the Outback gets about $1,500 of extra standard equipment that you don't find in the Subaru Legacy, that puts the real cost of the wagon upgrade right around $2,200. All models of the Legacy come fairly well equipped with standard all-wheel drive, standard automatic transmission, the standard 6.2-inch infotainment system with smartphone app integration, and roof rails. On the surface of things, it may appear that the Legacy is approximately the same starting price as a Toyota RAV4 or some of the other compact crossovers in America, but it actually is less expensive because keep in mind, again, all-wheel drive is standard and the average compact crossover in America starts as a two-wheel drive vehicle. For most people, the premium trim is going to be the true base price that gives you things like the dual zone climate control, more USB ports, and the larger infotainment system, as well as two extra speakers that most drivers are going to demand. If you want leather in your vehicle, you'll have to pay $32,390 for the limited trim that also includes the up-level sound system and a few other goodies. The top-end touring trim that we've been driving this week started at $35,995, and that's essentially as loaded as you can get your Outback. You'll notice on this lineup that the EyeSight safety system is listed as being standard on the Touring, but it is also available in most of the trims of the Outback, except for that base trim. If you want the 3.6-liter .6 six-cylinder engine, it will cost you between $2,200 and $2,600, depending on the trim you add it to. It's only available in the Limited trim and the Touring trim. The reason the difference between the 2.5 Limited and the 3.6 Limited is a little larger than the Touring is because HID headlamps are standard with the 3.6 liter engine, they're optional with the 2.5. Comparisons are tricky with the Outback, not just because this is the only mid-size station wagon in the mainstream segment in America, but also because this is a little bit different than the station wagon you may remember from your childhood. This has the ground clearance of a Jeep Grand Cherokee and all-wheel drive is standard. As such, the Outback is not really the same thing as a RAV4 or a CRV or any of the other vehicles in the compact crossover segment that are relatively similarly priced to the Outback. A Toyota RAV4 starts at $24,910. If you want all-wheel drive in that RAV4, it's $26,310. That's just about the same price as a comparably equipped Outback. 
Although the RAV4 does not come with standard all-wheel drive, it does come with a boatload of standard features, a little bit more standard feature content than we find in the Subaru. Interestingly enough, the RAV4 is likely going to be less capable off-road than the Outback, primarily because of the ground clearance that we find in the Subaru. So the Subaru can clear larger sticks, larger logs, larger ruts than you could in the Toyota. The all-wheel drive system in the RAV4 is one of the most capable in this segment because it does have the ability to mechanically lock the center coupling. That's actually something that you cannot do in the Subaru Outback, although you can engage X mode and have the computer try and control that center coupling in a more off-road oriented fashion. The big difference is going to be the seating position and the way the vehicle feels out on the road. Even though the Outback is higher off the road than the RAV4, it feels more like a traditional car while you're driving it. The center of gravity is definitely lower, so even though we have a decent amount of body roll and the suspension is fairly soft, it's going to handle more like your average mid-size sedan than the average compact crossover. In addition to that, the seating position in the Outback is definitely more relaxed. It's not as upright as the RAV4. Some people may find that an advantage. Some people may actually dislike that. The most direct competitor to the Outback in the U.S. right now is the Volkswagen Golf Alltrack, but that's not actually the best comparison because the Golf Alltrack is a compact station wagon, not a mid-sized station wagon. A more appropriate comparison would be a Volkswagen Passat that had been jacked up and had all-wheel drive added to it, but that's not available in the United States. Even though the Alltrack is smaller than the Outback, it actually is a little bit more expensive. All-wheel drive is standard, but an automatic transmission is not. So it starts at $25,850, but $26,950 when you comparably equip that Alltrack to a base Subaru Outback. I do like the interior just a little bit more in the Golf than in the Subaru, but it's unquestionably smaller. Acceleration is better in the base Alltrack thanks to its standard turbocharged engine, and handling is better in the Alltrack as well. The big reason for that is that the Alltrack is not as high off the ground as the Subaru, so it's not going to be as capable off-road, although the handling does improve as a result. In fact, Volkswagen increases the ride height less than one inch versus the regular Golf wagon. Because the Golf is a smaller vehicle overall, the trunk is notably smaller, the back seat is not quite as wide, and we don't find the same kind of roomy feel that we see in the Subaru. In a nutshell, the Golf is going to be more capable on-road with better handling, better acceleration, and overall better handling feel. The Subaru is going to be better off-road and going to be more comfortable regardless of the road surface. The suspension is a little bit softer, we get significantly more ground clearance, and overall it's just going to be able to go places you couldn't go in your Golf Alltrack. A lot of people used to refer to the Subaru Outback as the discount Volvo Cross Country. It's certainly a lot less expensive than the Volvo Cross Countries that are on sale these days. The closest in terms of overall price to the Subaru Outback is the V60. If you consider $16,000 more expensive, close to the Subaru Outback in terms of overall price. The V60 Cross Country has a very different mission than the Subaru, however, because the V60 is obviously focused at on-road ability. The suspension is very firm for a vehicle in this sort of off-road station wagon category, the ground clearance is really not much higher than the regular V60 either. Compared to the Subaru Outback, acceleration is absolutely excellent, fuel economy is excellent, and comfort is excellent. We also have a lot of luxury options on the inside, but the inside is going to be smaller than the Subaru Outback, especially the trunk. It's going to be significantly more expensive than the Subaru Outback, and it's going to be less capable off-road. So if you're looking for a vehicle to complement your country lifestyle, where you're living a mile or two down a gravel road, the Outback is going to be more comfortable, although the V60 is going to be a little bit more fun when you actually transition onto paved roads. The Outback may be a little bit quirky, but as someone that's owned a station wagon in their adult life, I do have a special place in my heart for the Outback. It's a quirky alternative to the average compact crossover. It's also a quirky alternative to the average mid-size sedan. Because if you're looking for a mid-size sedan and you want more room in the back seat or more cargo space or more headroom in the back seat, then the Subaru Outback is an excellent alternative. On the other hand, if you're one of the people that's out there looking at a compact crossover, but you want something that's a little bit more car-like, it's also a good alternative in that respect. Although folks in the U.S. don't really seem to be shopping for station wagons like they used to, Subaru has obviously carved out a very specific market for the Outback wagon. When it comes to my top pick in this segment, you should know that I value acceleration and the handling ability a little bit more than the ground clearance that we see in the Subaru Outback. And that's why the 2017 Volkswagen Golf All-Track is still my top pick in this segment. However, the Subaru Outback, especially in the top end trim, is an excellent alternative. Again, the Outback is going to be more comfortable. It's also going to be more roomy on the inside, but its drivetrain doesn't feel quite as refined as we see in the Golf All-Track, and it doesn't handle quite as well either. 
I suspect, however, if Subaru puts their four-cylinder turbocharged engine into the Outback at some point, it would take the top pick in the segment. If money is no object, then I would recommend going with the 2017 Volvo V60 Cross Country, but again, keep in mind the suspension is going to be much firmer than the Subaru Outback, and the back seat and the trunk are going to be significantly smaller. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes, and this has been the 2017 Subaru Outback. Be sure and check out the related videos on the side of your screen. Find us on facebook.com slash alexandautos. You can also head over to alexandautos.com as well. I'll see you next week.